straight over to uh, Richard Tice, my fellow Talk TV presenter and, of course, leader of the Reform UK Party, who's been waiting patiently while I was ranting there. But it, it is a busy time, isn't it? There's a lot going on, Kevin, as you've just expressed. It's hard to know where to start, is it? It really is. But I guess we've got to start with uh, essentially the... It's sort of the, the end of the beginning. No, actually, it's the beginning of the end of the leadership contest because, in truth, yeah, five, uh, the winner, six weeks to go the winner is, 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 to all intents and purposes, certain, and yet we've got weeks and weeks and weeks more mm -hmm. through August mm -hmm. when no decisions are being made as crises mount up. I mean, the intray mm -hmm. for, uh, essentially, Liz Trust because, mm -hmm. uh, in barring some form of catastrophe and disaster, she is going to win this by a country mile. In fact, given the current direction of travel, Kevin, I think this could actually be a, yeah. a complete humiliation for yeah. Rishi Sunak. He did a hust they did a hustings yesterday up in Leeds, yeah. and uh, just everywhere. The, the she just slaughtered seems to be, him again, didn't yes, she? Yes, she did. She and, slaughters and him every time. And we keep hearing he's supposed to be, you know, this intellectual colossus, uh, you know, with the intellectual capacity to be the Prime Minister. But, but he hasn't got the intellectual capacity to run a decent campaign. Well, he may be an intellectual colossus, but he's not a political colossus yes. because he's shown huge political naivety for some considerable period of time yes, now. Yes, he has, yeah. and, and completely out of touch with the challenges and the worries and the anxieties of millions of families up and down the country uh, and, and just seems completely sort of devoid of any solutions to that. And here's the thing, he keeps on banging on that we've got to get on top of inflation, but he never says how he's going to. <laughs> So, look, it, it's, it's, all, it's all well coming up point. with the problem, yeah. but actually, what about some solutions? Yeah. And, you know, Liz Truss has got some solutions. Yeah. And she's, I think her, she's got a much stronger policy team. She completely wowed the audience yesterday with a big policy on committing to HS3. That's the, the east-west mm. northern rail link, yeah. nothing to do with HS2. Frankly, um, that should have been done ahead of HS2, but that's another whole story. So she's coming up with constructive policy ideas concrete policy concrete and he's just banging on saying i'm going to make your lives ever more miserable now uh, history will uh, record uh, that there was a decisive moment in this battle to get to number 10 downing street uh, it was of course ben wallace i think we've got uh, ben spoke to uh, he's the defense secretary of course he spoke to jeremy kyle this morning uh, let's have a little reminder of what he was saying uh, we'll, we'll get that video ready right now uh, but uh, Dennis, but Dennis. he but he wrote a piece in the Times and he effectively said uh, that Rishi Sunak is a treacherous snake who stabbed Boris in the back and abandoned his post in the nation's hour of need. It couldn't have been more harsh on Rishi, could he? It was, it was a devastating intervention, not only saying that he essentially abandoned his post, but also saying that actually the Prime Minister and Liz Truss has backed his call for more defence spending and with the clear inference that actually Rishi Sunak uh, prevented additional s defence spending at a time when, when, sadly, we face ever greater international uh, challenges uh, with regard to the national security and our defence. And so I think that's really significant. And again, you see, uh, Liz Truss has talked about increasing defence spending to 3% of, of mm. the size of our economy, yeah, of GDP, yeah. by 2030. Sunak, nowhere, not even on the playing field. No. And I think it's... Here's, he, here's is the he thing. obsessing on his children and Here's his the thing, though, Kevin. Yeah. It's so bad in the Sunak camp that you've actually got uh, some of his supportive MPs <laughs> beginning to very quietly, very gently, <laughs> oh, oh. just sidle over <laughs> to senior figures in the trust camp. Well, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm really... Back I'm really, the wrong horse here. Back the wrong horse here, yeah. but I'm really supportive of what Liz does. Yeah, and yeah. So yeah, when, all when of this you, is when going you do on. win, Liz, uh, any jobs going in the cabinet? Yeah, the, you know, mm. I've supported you all along, even though I said I was supporting Rishi Sunak. Let's uh, have a look at uh, Ben Wallace talking to Jeremy Kyle this morning. <laughs> Look, I think it's right that members have a choice. Uh, Rishi offers one view of, of economics and, and how he wants to fix uh, the nation's problems. Liz does as well. Uh, you know, I have, uh, I have, you know, worked with them up close in the cabinet for two years. I've reg sat next to Liz Truss in national security councils and international fora around the world. Uh, and, you know, they both have a, quite rightly, we should offer a choice to, to the Conservative Party members about who they want to lead. Uh, I don't think throwing the towel in would help. Uh, but, you know, and, and also not, none of this is certain, you know, uh, I should think trying to actually survey Tory members is almost impossible. Uh, <laughs> everyone is different. And, and I, I think fundamentally what I would say. 
Now, Ben Wallace is a darling of the True Blue Tory party members, uh, a very influential character. As you say, he could not have been harsher on Rishi Sunak today. Uh, and this will be the turning point, won't it? Yeah, I think, look, essentially, I think it's all over. And... Uh, let Sunak can't quit, but there have to be real question marks. Do we need another five weeks of this? Really? Is that in the national interest? It, it's essentially... Why couldn't they, for example... I never understood why it was so long. I, I always criticise the duration of the whole period, and I think I've been absolutely proven you're right. right. Absolutely. They could still, though, they could still say, the direction of travel is clear, we're going to bring it forward a couple of weeks, to mid-August, to end this, because actually, important decisions that affect millions and millions of families up and down the country need taking. They can't wait until September the 5th or the 6th or the 7th, you know, when uh, Liz Truss's winner starts to appoint a cabinet. You know, these decisions, these are massive. Yeah. The cost of living crisis, the risk of, of energy shortages, these are really, really significant things that, the, you know, frankly, the government have got to get on with. And I think it's, I almost think it's negligence not to be addressing this. Nothing's going on, no decisions are being taken. And uh, the other thing that Rishi, I think, ha has not been good enough on it is, as you just mentioned, the uh, energy crisis, the energy bills crisis, the cost of living crisis. Uh, he is not uh, coming up with enough plans to help people through this. You know, in October, everyone's uh, energy bills will go up to £3,300. If you're a pensioner, that's a third of your entire income. In January, it'll go up to probably 4500 And they're talking possibly uh, within months, uh, £500 a month. Now, that is not sustainable. Now, Millions of people can't afford that. We all know that's not sustainable, and we actually need a cabinet and a government starting to focus on it now to come up with some important solutions. Because on the one hand, you've got that. On the other hand, you've got huge corporations like Shell, like BP, like Centrica, making ever more billions of profits and giving it back to shareholders. Mm -hmm. And there'll be a real loss of confidence in the whole issue of free markets and capitalism unless something significant goes on. Because this is only going to go on. Putin is going to keep restricting the supply of gas. And you know, we face, we face the gravest energy crisis, I think, since the Second World War. And we need a government that is that is facing into that now, not on September the 6th. Yeah, and uh, lest we forget, if we want to see how bad things can get, if you carry on with crazy carbon net zero green claptrap, you end up like Germany, uh, which is now a basket case, uh, staring into the abyss of a recession. Uh, they're having to dim the, tr the uh, street lights. They're closing public swimming pools. People are being told to take shorter showers, all because of a mad green policies Correct. pursued by the allegedly brilliant politician Angela Merkel, surely the most overrated politician in the history of politics. Let's talk uh, in a little while, though, Richard. We'll have a look at some uh, exclusive video that you've brought in, which proves uh, very much that the uh, migrant crisis continues apace as we speak. Of course, they're pouring in right now across the because the weather's so nice. Uh, but before we get to that, a very significant decision today we learned of uh, last night in fact, that the Tavistock Clinic, which treated trans kids, which uh, took children and helped them change their gender and gave them puberty blockers just in case, uh, you know, they wanted to change gender later in life, uh, is to close. It's closing down. That's a big moment, isn't it? And thank heavens and thank God, and all I say is not before time. In fact, what I'm just slightly concerned about is that it's not closing until spring next year. You know, why does it need to take so long? Because and, and a number of newspapers have encapsulated this really well. But the truth is that uh, this clinic was essentially treating children, vulnerable children, who were, uh, were sort of anxious and, and, and had mental health issues. They were treating them like guinea pigs. It was, it was experimental. It was ex with experimental drugs over which they had no idea of the long-term implications. And this didn't just go on for a, a few months, a year or two. This has been going on for well over a decade, and people knew and whistleblowers tried to blow the lid, and time and time again, once again, uh, essentially our public services failed to take the right, bold, courageous decision and shut it down. It's taken far, far too long. I think they should accelerate it 
it's awful. And uh, we need to really look into why this ever started. Uh, they were talking to kids as young as four. Yeah. Parents bringing in four-year-old kids, grown adults, doctors for God's sake, saying, oh, yes, you are gender dysmorphia, you are in the wrong body. Four years old. Uh, it, it, the insanity of it I, just I, beggars I was, belief. I was struck by a headline in today's mail which said this could become the greatest medical scandal of the century. Just think about that. Yeah. You know, it's, I think it's way more significant than any of us dare believe. I mean, it's, you know, it's just awful. And it happened literally on the NHS's watch. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't go as far as uh, the brilliant uh, Sun and Times columnist Rod Little, but uh, he always described the Tavistock Clinic as Frankenstein's castle. Uh, it's actually quite near where I live. I drive past it quite a lot. and it, it, I don't know. Every time I go past it, I think, what is going on behind those walls? I mean, the idea that grown adults, doctors, psychiatrists, you know, could look at kids five years old and say, yes, you're in the wrong body. What a load of rubbish. Yeah, just, just damaging rubbish. And then they awful. give them these uh, puberty blockers when they reach their teenage. These drugs affect them for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And, the, and the thing was, they don't know how they affect them. That's the... the I mean, it's, it's just... It, it's indescribably awful. And I just hope, actually, that this clinic closes... Uh, earlier than his forecast in spring There has to be a public inquiry. And, and there should be a proper inquiry, in a sense, and it, but a prompt one, uh, because what we don't want is a sort of three, four, five-year inquiry. Mm. You know, we want something happening yeah. promptly. And, you know, people need to be held to account for this stuff. You know, really, we've got really. to hold people to account. They've got to know, when you make a mistake, you know, admit it, learn from it rapidly, yeah, yeah. don't cover it up. Yeah. Let's circle the wagons and say we were right all along. That place was wrong all along. Uh, now, uh, let's talk about the migrant crisis. We're going to play some video that you've brought in from our friend Kim, who lives in Dungeness, and she's been filming. Uh, she often films these uh, migrants as they... Here they are. Look at this. This is exclusive to Talk TV. Uh, this was yesterday, I think, uh, certainly this week. And this is what's happening now, Richard. All Look at them. A huge long line of them, uh, of course, uh, being given the protective uh, uh, coats and uh, plastic uh, rain wear to uh, make sure that their arrival is comfortable. They'll no doubt get, here they go, they'll be giving pizzas here uh, as they are greeted in the reception area. They'll be taken to a four-star hotel. On it goes, on it goes. And, and on it goes. And essentially, uh, every boatload that arrives is a transfer. It's, it's a multi-million pound transfer of liabilities from France to us taxpayers here in the UK. Uh, all men, all young men, um, and essentially economic migrants, like all of us, looking to, looking to improve their lives. We all, you know, there are millions of people in the UK that want a better life, that are you know, having a really tough time at the moment. Yeah. And, you know, we, these two leadership candidates say they're going to go on the top of this. Um, we'll believe it when we see it. Yeah, well, Rishi came out with a ten-point plan which uh, didn't really have any points in it. Was, there was probably about like, one point that yeah, may be any different to what's going about. on at the moment. Uh, uh, what he did concede is uh, that uh, we would have to look at our membership of the European Convention on Human Rights. I think it needs to be a little stronger no, than that. We need to leave. We, there's no question that as long as we are a member of the ECHR, then essentially... Um, the uh, the human rights lawyers will always win the day. And uh, so I think, you know, we have got to leave the AC ACHR. There's no question about that. Um, but the real solution is to stop them leaving the French shores. And, you know, they've got to do a deal with France, have a joint processing centre in France, where people are dealt with promptly within a couple of weeks and uh, decisions made. That's That's the only way this is dealt with in the media term, and, and that's what a new leader has got to sort out. And dare I say, start flying some of them to Rwanda, yeah. and we will never get one of those planes off the ground as long as we are in the ECHR. That's that's my position, that's your position, and I think that's that's the reality. We've already seen what these lawyers can do, and uh, it's it's got to change, mm. because the, the, the annual cost, it's not just five million a day in hotels. Mm. The, the cost is way bigger than that in terms of all the add-ons, the outsourcing, the legal fees, 
uh, and on and on it goes. It's 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 billions and billions of pounds every year. And just, you know we've we've got a we've got an economic crisis here. Indeed, I'm just looking at uh, well, three million pounds a day for the hotels uh, that we check them into, and then many of them just walk out. It's always been the elephant in the room that people go, oh well, you know we take the host these really nice hotels. It's well so and, expensive. There was there's there is nothing to stop them just walking out. But and tragically, disappearing, tragically, and they do. They're, they're often then being essentially. Uh, taken into modern day slavery yeah. here in the UK, yeah. where they're fo they're forced to do work, uh, but essentially receive uh, no uh, no payment for that because they're trying to pay off the debts they uh, they took on in order to make the crossing. Look, I mean, uh, this is the first time I've seen this video. I'm just looking at it now. I mean, it's like a, a it's like a holiday aircraft has just landed and then going through passport control. Uh, very very nice treatment they get when we when they arrive, isn't it? I just think that uh, everybody knows this has got to be dealt with, and uh, when you've in, in the summer, obviously, when uh, there's less wind out there, then uh, I mean, I think the number now is uh, well north of twelve, thirteen thousand uh, who've already come, and you know we know that these numbers will increase uh, rapidly throughout August and September, and will will way way uh, out um, uh, outsize out outdo the, the number from last year. Um, uh, I think we probably spoke about this uh, last week, but um, uh, Britain's not on fire, is it? Uh, the, this, a couple of hot days do not mean that we have, uh, you know, a renewed, even worse climate change crisis. It, this hysteria has got to stop, hasn't it? Uh, of, of course it has. And yes, you know, we had a couple of hot days, but the reality is we still haven't had as long a period, consecutive days over 30 degrees, that we had in 1976, when to remind people, all of the experts, mm. back in the 70s, all of the experts were saying, we're going into a global ice age. Mm. Yes, that's so, right. So, you know, very often, when you've yeah. got a consensus of expert opinion, very often they could be to get the wrong opinion. Yeah, so that, and that, don't forget that the uh, climate change catastrophists are saying, this could shape up to be the hottest summer in British history. And when was the coldest summer in British history? Last year. <laughs> So it's just no, I mean, not... Look, the, the, the reality is that, yes, we're in a, a, a warming phase, yeah. but we would be better to spend money adapting mm. to uh, the current sort of warming cycle than trying to mitigate it, when actually climate change has gone on from the year dot, millions mm. of years ago, yeah. and will go on for the next few millions yeah. of years. Of course, and there are far, far bigger factors that are completely yeah. out with our control uh, that influence climate change than greenhouse gases and emissions. Absolutely. Uh, Richard Tice, uh, leader of the Reform UK Party, thank you for coming in. Great to talk to you, as always.